We're still in chapter 6, the uh, living the impersonalization of error, living the principle of impersonalization of God. We're at a place in the book of John where there is a preparation for the Last Supper. And in this preparation there is a much truth teaching, great discoursing about the nature of the purpose of Christ on earth. And I think it would be wise for us to see what Christ says is Christ's purpose rather than for you or me to decide what his purpose is. And so the purpose of Christ is stated as thus, thusly. We find it in several places in the book of John. Here I'm looking at John 9, 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And so we see a plan there, which is a total reversal of all human concept. For we who think we see are to be made blind, and those who see not are to be made to see. And this reversal of concept, this awakening, is from the dream of mortality. And the closer we get to the truth, the more uncomfortable it becomes, the more we are in a state of rebellion against it. Unless, of course, we have so been touched by the Spirit that even the degree of newness and strangeness of the new life that comes upon you is welcomed with a great inner joy. And if the truth frightens you to the point that you want to back away, then that is a sign that you are not yet among that remnant which is called the seed of Christ, who are ready to move into that which is unknown to the mind of man. And if you are not ready to release your concept and to be made blind, so that you can see, and to give up what you see, knowing that in truth what you see is not what is there. You're not in that frame of consciousness which says to the Christ, I am ready. I'm ready to yield. I'm open. I have no concepts about the outer world. Now again, in other places in John, to clarify this purpose of making the blind see and the those who see, not see, we come to such passages as John 3, 14, 15, and 36. As Moses, always Jesus is speaking, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The Son of Man must be lifted up. And I guess by now we can probably say unanimously that we know the Son of Man to be our spiritual selfhood. Born of woman into the flesh and therefore a son of woman in the first mortal birth and then reborn of the Spirit 
We are called son of man, no longer of woman. The son of man, the awareness of spiritual selfhood, must be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That whosoever believeth in his own spiritual selfhood should not perish, but have eternal life. And so, if we were to fear leaving our loved ones, it would be because we have not yet reached the place where we have accepted their spiritual reality. And if we have reached a place where we accept their spiritual reality, then we know that our function is to lift them up to the awareness of that spiritual reality. For the Son of Man is not only our own individual identity, but is the individual identity of all those we know. And so our function now is to lift the Son of Man here where I stand, there where you stand, there where the child is born, there where the old man appears to be dying. Always there is the invisible spiritual self would call the Son of Man. And so lifting up the Son of Man is coming out of the blindness it's coming out of the false sense of sight which doesn't see the spiritual son, but only sees the first or natural birth, the physical man. We're trying to see what the purpose of Christ on earth is. And it would appear at this point that the purpose of Christ on earth is to awaken us to the spiritual nature of all being, to the spiritual nature of the universe to the invisible reality that underlies all physical form. But if that be the purpose, and we are told that when you awaken to spiritual selfhood, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you shall not perish, then what are we really being told about the concept of life that we entertain before we awaken to spiritual selfhood. We're told that we shall perish. And we're also told that if we're to leave it, to rise above it, it cannot be reality. Why should Christ come to take us out of reality? And so we have to face that truth which that which is that where we are, what we are doing as human beings in mortality is the dream, and unless we have accepted that, we continue to live in that dream. Now we've had our various talks about the dream. The question now is, are we accepting that it is our function to awaken from the dream of mortality? Let's presume that the message so far has made an impression sufficiently to arouse us to the need to awaken from the dream of mortality. And that would constitute the coming out of the blindness and now we have to look out at the world and say, well, what is it? If it's a dream, how do you live in a dream? And how do you step out of a dream? And the minute you move in this direction, you find an answer. Well, what did Jesus do? How did Jesus live in the dream? And how did Jesus step out of the dream? And then suddenly it's clear that his purpose, his mission, was to teach us how to step out of the dream. To step out of the dream of mortality 
into the presence of spiritual selfhood. Clearly is the mission. And with every mission there must come a method. Let's go further. John 3.36 He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Now then, the Son is no longer Jesus Christ. The Son is your spiritual selfhood. He that believeth on his spiritual selfhood hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son, he that believeth not in a spiritual selfhood, shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth in him. <coughs> Always the wrath of God and the vengeance of God has been misconstrued. The wrath of God is the doctrine of karma. Karma remains the fate of the individual who is not living in spiritual selfhood. There is no karma, no divine wrath. That's all it means, karma. There is no divine wrath or karma in spiritual selfhood, and there is no death in spiritual selfhood, and there is no reincarnation in spiritual selfhood. Now, it gets uncomfortable then because we're past the stage of being able to use a quotation or to remember a truth and expect the veil or fog or mist to lift. It's the way you're living in or out of spiritual selfhood that determines whether you are in the state of karma or not. And so again, the mission is further clarified to dissolve the mist of the dream that man may walk in the kingdom of God in his eternal spiritual selfhood. And further, to be underlined, I think, is the fact that this would not be given to us if it were a remote possibility. If it were not ordained that there would be those walking in spiritual selfhood, there would be no purpose for such a mission. And then further, inasmuch as the mission of Christ is actually infinite spirit functioning infallibly, those of us who cannot walk with this mission are merely walking against that which is inevitable. Spirit doesn't fail. And so all you can do by turning away is to turn away from that which is invincible. And the continued karma is the turning away from that which is the ordained will of the Father on earth. In other words, walk in your spiritual selfhood or continue to perish and reincarnate is quite clearly the message at this point. Live in the dream and suffer the double-sidedness of this world or find your way out of the dream through the principles prescribed by the Christ, by the infinite way, by whatever measure or teaching in the world enables you to awaken from the dream of mortal selfhood. Again, in John 8, to further clarify the Christ mission, 828, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, meaning when you have attained your spiritual selfhood are walking in it 
know yourself to be spirit indivisible with the Father immortal eternal omnipotent when you can recognize your spiritual selfhood everywhere without division then ye will know then shall ye know that I am he the Christ speaking these words walking the earth in the appearance called form is your spiritual selfhood and you are given an opportunity to first out of human vision out of human understanding to come face to face with your own spiritual selfhood functioning on the very earth you walk when you have raised the son of man in you then shall you know that I am he the very son of man raised in you is the Christ speaking to you saying this now and this is revealing the infinity of Christ that Christ in you is Christ in your neighbor and this is the truth then that must be accepted or it is violated by ignorance Christ in you is Christ in me Christ in everyone you know is your spiritual self the son of man is the invisible Christ which is the one indivisible self on this earth the knowledge of this the practice of this the living of this until it is realized understood demonstrated and experienced is the meaning of lifting up the son of man and then in 824 I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins for if ye believe not that I am he ye shall die in your sins and so your own self the infinite Christ says until you accept yourself you shall die in your sins and your sins are primarily living in a second self which is not the invisible infinite Christ self and we all have died in our sins many times and have reincarnated many times because we did not know that we are that one infinite self called Christ the son of man we all thought we were sons of women we all thought we were that which came forth in form and Christ tells us no you're not that you're the pure spirit of God one with the father that which dies can never give birth to life there's no woman on the earth who can give birth to life life is the spirit of God it is the constant behind the changing visible material world of flesh and always both the child and the mother are the one and the same invisible son of man now this then is the purpose and you can elaborate it of course it is to awaken us from the dream of mortality into the realization of the divine selfhood which is indivisible so that instead of four billion forms we are living in one invisible Christ and then we can accept the powers of Christ as the only present powers and so from that from the knowledge of self we can come to the impersonalization of both God and error God ceases to be person and because Christ is all because the invisible infinite Christ is God and this is the allness we learn to by accepting Christ 
look upon that which is called the world as imagination. It shows not the full perfection of Christ. We are looking at limited individual states of consciousness everywhere, none fully aware of Christ, some in high states, some in lesser states. Always we're looking at an up and down awareness across the universe. This shows forth then as our world. Now it is difficult, but very important for us to make a turn again in the practice of stepping out of the dream. You know the world that is there being both an appearance of good and evil is not the divine creation. You know the world that is there is but an overshadowing of human consciousness where the infinite invisible Christ is. And so you can accept that the world is not there, but only appears to be there. Christ isn't sharing the world. Christ is there. The world is not there. There's no God and. And so we come to this conclusion, and the conclusion in mind and intellect is not enough, but it's a start. The world is not there. It is in the world mind. In the world mind there is a world. And whoever lives in the world mind sees the world. And so if you are in the world mind, you see everything that's in the world mind. If there's a flood in the world mind, as a person, you too are in the world mind and therefore you must see the flood. If there's a hurricane in the world mind, you as a person being created of the very fabric of the world mind, you must see the hurricane. Everything in the fabric of the world mind must appear in your experience because you are the fabric of the world mind until you have lifted up the Son of Man. And so as creatures, persons, human beings of flesh, we are made of the fabric of the world mind. Not divine, but of the dust. And as we continue to walk in the fabric of world mind, the evil, the good, the opposites, the pairs of opposites of the world mind must continue to function in our experience because everything within the dream functions in the experience of those who live in the dream. If there's a skyjacking, you have to witness it because as a creature, the very skyjacking in the sky and the people on the ground are made of the same fabric, the world dream. There's no escaping the activities within the world dream as long as you are made of the fabric of it. And we are all made of the carnal mind. We are all in our second selves. The false sense of self which is the fabric of the dream mission of the Christ is to awaken us from that fabric of the dream into divine selfhood and lo and behold the process is to walk through the dream awake. You're not going to demolish the dream with truth. You're going to have to walk through it with your eyes wide open. Awake, not sleepwalking. Mortality is sleepwalking. Awake to the dream, we accept the power of Christ behind the dream. And Christ being all power, all presence, all mind, Christ functioning, Christ being here, Christ being there, Christ being self, we are in the reality, the cause, accepting the cause, and therefore not resisting the dream, not fighting the dream. 
aware that the power of Christ is functioning even though the dream may show forth another power than Christ. The power that is showing forth in the dream is a dream power. The power of the hurricane, the power of the flood, the power of the skyjacking, all this is the dream power existing only to the persons in the dream. But when you have raised up the Son of Man, when you recognize that only spiritual selfhood exists, for you the dream is but an appearance without substance, and you stand in the knowledge of truth, in the living of truth, and you reject all apparent power in the dream, knowing there is no power anywhere in the universe that can oppose the power of Christ, which is the power of love. And so right where the flood, the hurricane, the skyjacking, the disease are, there is the power of Christ. Your function is to walk in that power, rejecting the pretense of power, which would appear to be true to every creature. And with the mind, you're not going to be able to do it until you have come past certain levels of that mind. Now, this is difficult. We'll have to go slowly, please. There's nothing in the world outside your mind. Absolutely nothing. The entire world, everything in it, including the hijacking, including the flood, including the hurricane, including every person you know, including every ocean, every star, and every planet. It is all in mind. It doesn't exist outside of mind. Whatever you know about this world, you know in your mind. Every sound you hear is not out there in the world, it is in your mind. Every sight you see is not out there in the world, it is in your mind. Your complete human experience is not out there, although it seems to be. The mechanism of it is probably beyond us to describe, but let's do it briefly. It's like throwing a ball against the wall. It bounces back. World mind sends an impulse. It hits your mind and it bounces back. It becomes a sound out in the world, but it's only a sound that entered into your consciousness and bounced back into what appears to be the world. Similar, similarly with everything you see and feel and touch. Now, put a television set where your chest is just put your head above it and your feet below it as if you were a walking television chest, uh, television set. And now watch. Here, right where your chest was, is this television set, and now there's an activity on the set, on the screen. It's outside where people can see it on the screen where you are, but the only way it can come to that screen is to come through the mechanism of the set. If there's a scene of a complete football game on the screen of your television set, right where you're wearing it, it has to come through to that screen, through the mechanism of the set. It cannot come into the appearance on the screen until it has come through the set. Now, everything that happens in this world is the same way. It seems to be out there, but before it gets out there, quotes, it comes through you, and then you see it as a distance thing, 20 yards away, 30 yards away, 50 yards away. But that distance is supposition. It's happening in you. It's happening in your mind, and it's planted there by the world mind, and so it seems outside you. It's as if you were two minds in one. 
You have the world mind and the individual human mind, and in between them, through this mechanism, you see an external world where all you're seeing is your own mental activity, which is controlled by the world mind. Now then, as you practice some exercises we'll now take, you find that you can control your reaction to what happens in the world. Every sound can be realized to be within me instead of outside me. So that as you take this into a specific exercise and just sit in your living room or on your veranda or wherever you care to sit and for 20 minutes during the day just listen for sounds, any sound. And the minute you hear it, place the location of that sound within you, not outside. And please realize that that's where the sound is. It's within you. You can hear an airplane zooming and to the eye it's in the sky, but that sound is within you. It doesn't matter what the sound is out there. There's no sound in this world that is out there. Any sound you hear is within you. And when you are sitting there doing this, you won't feel much at first and you'll say, well, what about it? There'll come a time when suddenly there's a quickening within you, as if a new leather has been pushed or moved. And suddenly you feel, oh, that sound really is in me. It seems out there, but it's in me. Somebody's talking on the platform, but there's nobody up there really talking. That sound is within me. And when you know the sound is within you, you know that all sound is part of the dream. It's all in the mind. After you reach a certain point in your meditation on this, you will place every sound within yourself, knowing it's not out there. I would recommend that you only work with sound on one day and nothing else. And then on another day, I'd like to suggest that you work with sight and recognize that everything you're seeing is not out there. It's within you. It works the same way. The world mind is planning an image within you, and you are seeing that image external to you. But it isn't there because God is there. Nothing is external to you but God. The first image which causes the problem of more images is your own image. Having accepted this as you, you're seeing things external to this which you call you. But when you raise the Son of Man, the spiritual self, you will not accept this image of you. And you will know there can be nothing external to an illusion. Now practice seeing with the eyes, but knowing that what I see out there is not out there. If it were out there, God would have had to put it out there, and God didn't put the flood there, God didn't put the hurricane there, God didn't put the diseases there or the skyjackings there. God didn't put the avalanches and earthquakes there. God didn't put the cruelty and violence there. What am I seeing? I'm seeing a dream. What do you see a dream with? Your mind, with a dream mind. That which I am seeing out there is within me. Now, important to those who are moving out of this dream world is that you must be patient in your meditation on this subject. You will seem to be getting nowhere. It isn't enough to repeat and repeat and repeat and say there's nothing out there, it's all within me. 
I'm talking about the experience of it within you. The positive inner experience that that which I am seeing out there is within my mind. You'll find that you're lifted above the state of belief which accepts the reality of that which seems out there. You not only are transcending the mind, but you have the experience and the sure-footed knowledge that the visible world is in my mind. And you cannot get it by reading a book. You must practice the constant re-identification of all that you see as not being external, but being in your mind. And it doesn't matter if what you're seeing is as big as the sun, as big as the earth, as big as a star, it's still in your mind. And again, the processes that the world mind sends to you, to your mind, that which you think you're seeing external to yourself. Now, you must come to the place where you can feel this. You must come to the place where you can close your eyes someday and know that everything in the world is in my mind. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's a collision on the corner, if it's a bomb falling out of the sky, if it's the worst kind of holocaust ever described in Dante's Inferno, it's in my mind. It's all part of the dream world in the dream mind. And therefore, it is not a power. It is only a power in the dream. There's no person out there. There's no place out there. There's no action out there. There are no conditions out there. There is a dream out there. And right where that dream out there appears to be, the invisible spirit of God is perfect, harmonious, the presence of the kingdom of God on earth is right where my mind, under hypnosis, is conceiving a dream world. The Son of Man in you rises in proportion as you are willing, able, and disciplined enough to redeem the world, the sights, the sounds, the tastes, the smells, and the touches. And I would suggest that each day you take another sense, the sense of touch, the sense of sight, the sense of smell. Why, even the food on your plate is not out there. It cannot be. God didn't place it there. It is a world mind idea instantly telegraphed to this spot where you are, appearing as the food you're eating. External to the dream form, it is dream food. Now, this won't change your eating habits at first. But it will make you cognizant of the fact that you are manufacturing this physical world every moment with your dream mind. And that all those around you are doing the same. And it is only by redeeming the physical world, sitting in the constant knowledge that it is in my mind, that you will transcend the mind, that you will come into a state of control whereby your instant reaction to an outside stimulus will not be based upon that which is there, but rather upon your knowledge that the stimulus, which seems external, is in the mind. An earthquake in the mind has no power. A hurricane in the mind has no power. A disease in the mind has no power. Because your next step is, but I have no dream mind. There's only one mind, the mind of God. And the mind of God is doing absolutely nothing about these dream activities. 
the mind of God is doing nothing about a million people in the on the earth who die of heart disease another million who die of cancer another million who die of something else the mind of God is doing nothing about it why because it happens only in the dream of the human mind now you've talked about the unconditioned mind transcending mind living in the Christ mind and the Christ says fine but let's stop our talking do it redeem the dream world break the bubble and you must practice in order to do it because it takes a consistent conscious awareness of the dream for you to break the dream the dream is five senses bringing into you a world that is non-existent except in those five senses and unless you retrain your reaction to those senses to a state of non-reaction a state of knowing of being still non-resistant to the sense images you continue to move in the dream captured by the dream and dying in the dream every sound every sight is part of the dream unless the sound and the sight are in your inner senses unless you hear the voice that no one else can hear unless you see the sight that no one else can see the dream fabric makes cats and dogs and people oceans stars and planets the dream fabric makes all of the substances of our world and they are not substances in the kingdom of God they are only substances to the dream mind and we must be still in that dream mind the laboring in the vineyard is the conscious practice that I will not live in a dream world of images but rather I will redeem the images be still living in my spiritual selfhood free of the images making a transition from image to reality and this nurtures gives birth to the living Christ released as your conscious mind you find yourself unmoved by the evils of the world and finally unmoved by the good of the world and so that you overcome the sense of good and evil you overcome the belief in powers of the world and you understand why Joel emphasizes that because God is all power all else is none power now this is a turning because whenever you are able to practice this you will discover that the world which had given you so much to fear and doubt and worry about simply loses the power to do so you find you do not fear a world or an event or a circumstance when you have instantly found that it is only within your mind and the day of release is when you stand on that knowledge and discover the truth of it that there is no reality in the flesh there is no reality in matter there is no reality in material condition there is only the invisible son of man spiritual selfhood everywhere 
And lo and behold, that invisible spiritual selfhood everywhere can now be experienced as your selfhood because you have purified the world of that which is not there. Until then, your world was cluttered with images, with thoughts about things which weren't there. And the moment you have denuded that world of that which isn't there, only that which is there becomes your consciousness. You can feel at first a thin layer of spirit, as, if, as it were, and then a thicker layer, and finally the very texture of spirit everywhere, as all that is there, and it is your being. You come to one being. My spirit is there. How can an earthquake be there? My spirit is there. How can a flood be there? The omnipresence of your spirit automatically flows into recognition when you have removed the forms, the conditions, the sense evidence of a world that never was. And then the power, the omniscience, the all presence of your spirit is a living reality and no longer words that you memorized. You find what is called the arm of the Lord. The presence of spiritual power is automatic because all that is present, acknowledged, experienced is that spirit. Now when you reverse your raincoat or reverse a piece of cloth, you're doing what the Bible was telling us to do when it said repent. To reverse the activities of the mind. At the moment, the activities of the mind are saying, this is there, that is there, and this is there, and let's do something about this and that. Let's have a crusade. Let's take up a collection. Let's elect this fellow and not that one. Let's do these things in this life. And the reversal of that is, let's not do these things. Let's turn back. Let's turn away from the old way. Let's not just do it a better way. Let's just get rid of the old way completely. Let's do it this way. Let's let the Spirit do it. Let's bring the world into our mind consciously. and rest there, knowing all that remains is the invisible spirit everywhere, and let the spirit do its work. The return to the Father's house is the removal of a world. The return to the knowledge that only the Father is present Again, this too is part of the mission of the Christ. To enable you to pull the world into your mind and then rise above your mind, turning back to the Father. Spirit returns to spirit by dropping the conscious awareness of all that is not spirit. Now let's try it again so you'll see what we mean. In front of you is a dinner. It's out there and you're going to put it in your stomach. But the form that you're thinking of putting it into is not your spiritual self. Your spiritual self isn't sitting on a chair. Your spiritual self doesn't sit behind the wheel of an automobile. Your spiritual self is never finite. Your spiritual self is what the world calls God. God is your spiritual self. Your spiritual self is where the world seems to be everywhere, without division. 
Now who's going to eat this food that's set before this form? Another self is, a person. That person is not the Christ. That person is not the Son of Man. And yet that person has been claiming to be you all these years. Now you can go right ahead and eat that food as you've always done, or you can raise up the Son of Man. And to do it, you must see that the spiritual Son of God is not going to eat that food at all. Your sense of self is going to eat it, the person you have called yourself. And while you do this, you're not raising up the Son of Man, you're just living as another human being. And therefore, in your spiritual exercise, you know that that which stands before you is part of the dream world. That's why apples can rot. That's why food can deteriorate. That's why without refrigeration certain kinds of food cannot stand more than a day or two. Not because it's made by God, but because it isn't spiritual substance. It's the dream substance of the dream mind. So with the corruption of human flesh, it's the dream substance of the dream mind. And that which perishes is going to eat that food which is perishable. That's part of the dream. That's for those who have continued to walk in the world, professing to acknowledge God and to love God with all their hearts. But it's not for the divine seed, the remnant, who are stepping out of the dream. And so our exercise is simply to know that this form and that food are not external. They are simply dream fabric. The food and the form are made of the same dream fabric. One dream fabric makes the food and makes the form. And then it gives the form a capacity to think that the food is external and now the form wants to take the food within. None of this is of the Father. That's why you can be poisoned by food sometimes. It's not of the Father. There is nothing in the world that is of the Father. Nothing. And yet, where everything in the world seems to be, only the Father is. And so with your inner senses, where the food is, as you take it into mind and know that's where it appears, although it seems to be outside, it's in mind, what is there? Spirit is there. Your own self is right where the food is, appearing to you as food. And your own self is right where the form is, appearing to you as person. And that's the relative level of your consciousness at that moment. Person and food are what we in this state of consciousness see, feel, and experience. But we're going beyond that. We're going into a state of consciousness where there is neither person nor food, but only divine self, self-complete. And this isn't done mentally. It's done by the conscious awareness of the falsity of that which we have experienced with the senses and the feeling, the experience of a self that is independent of both the food that is on the table and of the person who is eating that food. Your self is independent of the form that is eating the food and the food that it is taking with it. Now, that is an experience that comes to you when you practice the truth of being. And it is a very important experience. When you can find yourself not where the food is and not where the person is. You'll know that you're living the mystical life. And you'll know that the dream, for you, doesn't hold as many threats as it once did. This is quite different than our reading of truth, as you see. In fact, everything we're doing in this class is for the purpose of the living experience 
of a spiritual universe, a spiritual selfhood. We are all learning how to lift the son of man, and the experience is a quite different than any we may have experienced in our readings or in our human sense of life. They're new, and there's no way to prepare for them by anticipation. They come upon you, and they come when you're ready. Just as a teacher appears when the student is ready, so does the experience appear when you are at that level of consciousness that is ready for the next experience. And it's you who determine this. As you move through and up, you are paving the way for new experience. Each experience becomes a preparation for the next. You're in the progression of spirit. And as I said, it becomes uncomfortable. But that's the badge of honor you wear, the capacity to move through these somewhat uncomfortable experiences until you find that they are very normal and they are the signs of your level of awareness to yourself. When you share them, you share them with those who, like yourself, are dedicated to the Spirit. But always you'll find that you are going through experiences that no one else is. And they are going through experiences that no one else is too. None of us go through identical experiences. We are all released in different ways. But the time for release is now. The mission of the Christ is to release us, to lift us beyond the normal concepts of the world. Some of us are frightened by these experiences I remember my fears, and I probably still have them. But when you're lifted out of yourself, even for a moment, there's always the wonderment about where will I go, what will I do? I don't know what's ahead. You're not going anywhere. And when the fear is there, it's very normal and there's nothing to be guilty about. But remember, it's a sort of a break, and the moment you have the fear, you put a break on the activity of spirit, you come back into mind, and that's the end of that particular experience. The moment you're back in mind, you're back in the dream. Leaving the dream can be a harrowing experience, but staying in the dream is much more harrowing. It's just that we're, a com we're conditioned to the tortures of the dream. We're not used to that which is unexperienced up to this point. Now then, you're going to find more of the new experiences as you start practicing according to this suggestion made today.